Nothing breaks you like seeing your child's killer smirk in court. They sit there in their orange jumpsuit, sometimes crying fake tears, sometimes just blank-faced, while you're drowning in an ocean of grief that most people will never understand. And what I have to say to you, you over there laughing, you over there smirking and smiling, my guess is a joke that you killed my daughter. Parents who lunge across courtrooms aren't thinking about right or wrong anymore. They're running on pure, primal rage, the kind that shorts out your brain's logical circuits. It's like your body is moving before your mind can catch up. When you've spent months seeing your kid's empty bed, their untouched phone, their favorite snacks going stale in the pantry, and then you have to watch their murderer act bored during their own trial, that math doesn't add up in your heart. The justice system asks victims' families to be civil, to trust the process. But when you're facing the person who stole your whole world, sometimes civilization feels like a joke. Jalen Forrest. On September 18th, 2023, 30-year-old Jalen Forrest beat his stepfather to death. That afternoon, cops showed up at this apartment on Broadleaf Drive in Louisville after getting a call about someone getting jumped. When they got there, it was just Jalen Forrest in the place with his stepdad, who was already badly hurt and didn't make it. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The most chilling part? Someone was on the phone with the stepdad when it went down. They heard him begging Jalen back up off me and get off me, get off me. A Louisville man is charged with murder in the beating death of his stepfather at an apartment in St. Dennis after a 911 caller said that she was on the phone with the victim and heard him being assaulted. Jalen's stepfather had several fractured ribs, a broken jaw, and signs of strangulation. This had been a frenzied attack and Jalen wanted to make sure he was dead. By the way, if there's a in your home and you're an adult, you can always leave. That's just to answer Jalen's defense, that he unalived his stepdad after he was abusive to him. According to an arrest report, the victim's stepson, Jalen Forrest, was still in the apartment and was arrested on a murder domestic violence charge. The whole family was outraged. During Jalen's court appearance, several relatives of the stepdad were heard interrupting the judge and calling for justice. So everybody is welcome to sit here and to listen. I'm not going to allow any um, outbursts or discussions or conversing amongst anybody in the courtroom, and I do expect everybody to conduct themselves appropriately. Since the judge said this, it's clear there had already been signs of interruption and outbursts. Everybody seemed on their best behavior afterward, until Detective Burns started testifying against Jalen. Detective Burns, were you involved in investigating a homicide that occurred on September 18th, 2023 at 4523 Broadleaf Drive? I was. They then made contact with a property manager or a maintenance. On, me. The judge repeatedly addressed Jalen's family, who got more agitated by the minute. Don't let that happen again. You mean Don't look back at her. Find your mother Ma'am, ma can we clear the court? Yes. No, just ma'am. I'm sorry if you're not able to. You, you, you're excused. But she did not seem to care, even when the judge asked her to leave the courtroom. Ma'am, you sick. I don't know what I'm going to Sir? The judge had two guards remove her, but before she could leave, this happened. The family couldn't bear that they lost two people in one day, their beloved stepdad, who remains anonymous to this day, and cruel Jalen, who they used to trust. The fight continued in the hallway, even as the judge threatened to hold them all in contempt. Jalen was put on a quarter million bond. He has not yet been sentenced. Jeffrey Clark. On July 4, 2022, Tamara Scott was trying to get away from her crazed ex, Jeffrey Clark, in the parking lot of Fraser Ward's apartments in Roseville, Michigan. She was now dating someone else, Jerry Robertson, and she was happy with him. But Jeffrey was that type of narcissistic, psychopathic man who saw Tamara as his possession. That night, Jeffrey tracked Tamara and Jerry down and chased them with a firearm through an empty parking lot at 3 a.m. Tamara watched in sheer terror as Jeffrey fired into his perceived rival. By the way, no one is your rival if their partner already broke up with you. Tamara was free to date whomever she pleased. Jerry died that night as Tamara screamed and begged Jeffrey to stop. He was shot seven times. Jeffrey Clark in court charged with, among other things, first degree premeditated murder. He allegedly killed Robertson in cold blood very early July 4th. One of his relatives was there testifying against her monster ex. He proceeded to tell me that he would kill me if I told on him. 
He told me exactly what he did to Mr. Robertson. He told me that Mr. Robertson begged for his life and that the only thing he was worried about was that he was on tether. Yeah, his only problem was getting caught violating his probation, not an ounce of remorse. The shocking video of the incident, caught by a CCTV camera, was also played in court. Seconds later, this went down. This was started by Jerry's twin brother. For minutes, he sat there looking at Jeffrey, expecting to see at least a little bit of worry or remorse. But he just stood there, expressionless. If anything, he would throw a mean look at his victim's family every now and then. And when he saw the video, Jerry's brother could not help himself anymore. He lunged at Jeffrey, and a huge kerfuffle started, with guards trying to break it, and more people getting involved, taking Jerry's brother's side. Jeffrey had one thing to say as he was getting dragged back to his cell. Man, they gonna see you! As if that was a problem, the jury took less than an hour to decide Jeffrey Clark's fate. Life in prison, no parole. James Sparks Henderson. I want you to lay in that bed and sit there and understand what you did. You took somebody away from us. We are the heart of our family. This horrible man is named James Sparks Henderson, and he openly admitted to taking five lives, including a newborn baby, in Cleveland in 2014. A gunman last November shot and killed three others inside this house, two men and a 17-year-old girl. Minutes later, that girl's mom, Sharita Johnson, and her unborn son were killed. The report is stomach-turning. The plea required Sparks Henderson to take responsibility for killing Lemon Bryant, 60, Shaylona Williams, 17, and Jario Taylor, 18, who were inside their house on November 21, 2014, on East 93rd Street, then shitting and killing Sharita Johnson, 41. Johnson was 26 to 28 weeks pregnant. Her baby, Juwan, was delivered at a hospital shortly after the shooting and died 16 minutes later. The Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office said the child died of prematurity and ruled the death a homicide. Yeah, the only survivor of that family was a 10-year-old girl, forever scarred by that experience. It gets worse. Sparks Henderson, after shooting the three people inside the home, took out his cell phone and snapped his own crime scene style photographs of the bodies, assistant Cuyahoga County prosecutor Blaze Thomas said in court Wednesday. This monster was proud of his deed. His only regret, not getting to unalive everyone in that family. Shockingly, it wasn't even his own family, as in many family side cases, but a friend's family. Please help us find a person who did this. Please. None of them deserve this. In court, James Henderson had a constant smirk on his face as the prosecutor described his horrific actions. First of all, that he acted alone in causing these deaths in counts one through five and the injuries in counts six and seven. Sharita's brother spoke in court. He looked James in the eye as he explained how he betrayed his and his whole family's trust in the worst way. My sister opened the door for you, looked out for you, acknowledged you. You a scum. You know you are. Your purpose was what? We have no sister, no mother, nobody for nothing. It's gone. Over senseless act, you for nothing. They didn't want to be bothered with you. You weren't satisfied enough. They gave you everything you had. You your own man. Why you didn't get your own? Sharita's brother initially just wanted to tell Henderson he was an entitled scum for destroying his family. But as he watched him smirk arrogantly, he couldn't help himself. The courtroom guards grabbed the brother and escorted him out before he could attack Henderson. But that angered his mother. In her eyes, that was not a problem that needed dealing with. They should have let her son hit Henderson if he needed to. Of course, that's not how courtrooms work. And if all victims' families were allowed to do this, few defendants would make it out of the courtroom alive. Sharita's mother explained why this happened, though. He all there laughing, making smirk faces, but Indeed, a later report said that Sharita's brother lunged at Henderson after telling him to wipe that smirk off your face. Imagine how horrible it feels to see your loved one's killer smiling and grinning at you, completely devoid of remorse or humanity. Not only did Henderson not apologize for his actions, but he still seemed proud of what he did, even months later, in the courtroom. He didn't even try to fake remorse for a lower sentence. Sharita's uncle was also there, looking Henderson right in the eye as he delivered his victim's impact statement. What I personally want to say to you yourself, if you want to smile, you can go ahead and smile, because that's not going to do anything. 
You know, I see. I, I, I really thought that you came in here remorseful because you got a hat on, and I usually see Muslims with that. So it just what you just did just kind of contradicted, contra, uh, contradicted your whole image right now. Like I thought that you came in here feeling remorseful, but obviously you smiling don't don't prove that. Several of the family members addressed his horrible smirk. It was hard to talk about anything else when this monster enjoyed being in the spotlight so much. And what I have to say to you, you over there laughing, you over there smirking and smiling, like it's a joke that you killed my daughter and that you killed both of my kids. It's not a joke that you had killed five people. How can you sit over there and wear that hat? How could you sit over there and laugh that you killed five people? Henderson never offered an apology. When he took the stand, his attorney spoke for him, offering blank words like, we can't take his actions back. They were only trying to avoid the death penalty at this point. The judge had this to say. Your experience is unimaginable to all but a tiny fraction of people. You have suffered a loss in an awful way that should never happen in a civilized society. James Sparks Henderon was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. It's still unclear why he chose to commit this unspeakable crime. Eric McCullough. Here is Eric McCullough after he was arrested and charged with assault and murder. On July 29, 2015, he took the life of his niece, Tayaha, in a frenzied attack witnessed by his 25-year-old friend, Antoine Lee. In fact, McCullough had assaulted Antoine, too, before taking Tayecha's life. Antoine attempted to perform CPR on Tayecha, but she succumbed to multiple stab wounds before the paramedics arrived at the scene. Antoine heard McCullough's disgusting last words to her. Dumb B-word. I hope you die. Later on, Antoine Lee arrived to testify against McCullough. He'd also been arrested on a different charge, hence the orange jumpsuit. Antoine Lee was so infuriated at McCullough that the moment he saw him, he lunged at him. Four or five deputies were needed to restrain him and remove him from the courtroom. To Lee's disappointment, Eric McCullough was only sentenced to six years in prison after his murder charge was reduced to manslaughter. His attorney had demonstrated that Tayecha was part of a gang, and this had been a tragic case of escalated gang violence. Reportedly, Tayecha had threatened to take Eric's life before this happened. Of course, that was just one witness's testimony, and Antoine Lee, who was there to witness the horrible incident, doesn't believe that story. He says Tayecha was a peaceful person who would never hurt Eric. Sadly, she isn't here to speak for herself, and Eric McCulloch's punishment might not be enough to make him think hard about his actions. Antoine Lee himself was sentenced to 11 months in prison. Both men have since been released. Zydarius Platt In 2009, Zydarius Platt from Georgia fired into the head of his pregnant wife. After his arrest, he showed zero expression, remorse, or emotion. Jelani Platt was 26 years old and expecting a baby. She was kind, nurturing, and excited to bring a life into this world. Instead, she lost her life at the hands of a controlling, psychopathic husband who only viewed her as an object. His psychopathic tendencies were observed closely by all the detectives and experts who met him afterward, but it was in vain. The judge himself addressed Platt lack of remorse. You're lucky they didn't seek the death penalty against you. I didn't see any remorse at all. When Jelani's brother watched him emotionless in the courtroom, he lost it. Yeah, that's another one of Jelani's relatives, encouraging her brother to off Zydarius. Of course, that didn't happen. In a courtroom, there's always multiple guards on high alert. Zydarius Platt was removed from the courtroom before he could suffer serious injuries. Jelani's brother was quickly restrained, but he continued kicking, screaming, and throwing objects at Platt. Zadarius Platt was sentenced to two life sentences. He won't be out hurting anyone again. Still, it hardly felt like justice looking at his face. He didn't seem to care if he lived or died, and he did not seem to care at all about the person whose life he took. The person he claimed he loved, the person he married. The worst part isn't even watching these monsters get sentenced. It's how they sit there looking bored, like they're waiting for a bus or something. Like taking someone's life was just another Thursday for them. You watch their face for any hint of feeling bad, of realizing they destroyed an entire 
entire family, but there's nothing, just empty eyes and maybe even a little smirk. The whole courtroom is drowning in grief, parents crying, siblings shaking, everyone's world completely shattered, and this person is just checking their nails or staring at the ceiling. It doesn't feel real. Even when the judge hits them with life in prison, their face stays blank. No tears, no I'm sorry, nothing. That's when it really hits you that they're built different, missing whatever piece makes most humans feel things, and knowing they'll never feel bad about what they did, that hits harder than any sentence. Gunfire erupting inside a federal courthouse, a defendant shot by U.S. Marshals inside the Salt Lake City Court after attacking a witness on the stand. This shocking story took place in April of 2014 in a brand new Salt Lake City courthouse. In fact, this was the very first hearing that would ever take place in this new courthouse. The city was proud of the new courtroom, which was supposedly full of impressive new features, but it could not have turned out to have been more of a disaster. Blast of gunfire erupted just as morning court began. Like, boom, 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 and then boom, 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 boom. It happened in a Salt Lake City federal courtroom packed with spectators, judge, and jury, all watching in horror Monday as 25-year-old defendant Siale Angelau went from listening to a witness testify against him to suddenly lunging for that witness. Siel Angelo was in court that day because he was an accused member of a very violent street gang. At the time, Sayel had been sitting and listening without restraints, when something a witness said sent him into a violent rage that would ultimately result in him being killed in front of a courtroom of people. But it wasn't until a year after he was killed that the public got to actually see the video showing what actually happened. It's a stunning video. Brett Tolman is a former U.S. attorney and has tried many similar cases similar to that of Siale Engelau. There certainly has been due process, which is which is good. After a years-long effort by the Utah Media Coalition, including KUTV, a judge ruled the public should see this video. The day started out pretty normal. It had been decided before the hearing that Sayel, even though he was a violent offender, wasn't going to have to be restrained while in the courtroom. If you're thinking that sounds like a recipe for disaster, you would be right. But there was a reason that the judge had agreed to this. It was all about appearance purposes and wanting Sayel to not look like a criminal when he was sitting in front of the jury. Normally, the procedure would be to have Sayel restrained underneath the table and drapes would be used to hide the restraints from the jury. But because this was a brand new courtroom, the drapes hadn't been ordered yet and it wasn't going to be possible to restrain him without everyone in the courtroom seeing. But Sayel had assured the judge that he didn't need to worry because he was going to be on his best behavior when he was in the courtroom. As Angelou told the judge he would behave, so he didn't need to be shackled. When you have a jury, you always want the defendant to appear like he is in regular, you know, civilian clothes, that he's not in handcuffs, that he has a fair shot at being treated fairly by the justice system. But ultimately, it was a very bad judgment call to have allowed Sayel to sit in that courtroom without any restraints. He didn't have so much as a pair of handcuffs on. Looking back, there were some pretty obvious red flags that this was a terrible idea pretty much as soon as Sayel came into the courtroom that day. The 25-year-old reportedly seemed restless and agitated when the guards brought him in. The first witness to testify against Sayel about his criminal behavior was a man named Veolia Tanifa. As Veolia sat in front of the courtroom answering prosecutors' questions, Sayel could reportedly be seen getting more and more irritated and giving the witnesses dirty looks. It was just a few seconds later that it happened, so fast that a lot of people could barely process what was going on. Sayel, overcome by anger, jumped to his feet. He reached forward and grabbed a pen from a nearby table, he then jumped in the air and flung himself at the witness. It was a court martial standing nearby who quickly pulled out his weapon and fired at Sayel just a few seconds later. The court martial later said that he had to pivot his body when firing at Sayel in order to avoid accidentally hitting someone who was sitting in the gallery, but his shots connected and he took Sayel down. On trial for racketeering, you see Angelou grabbing what was later identified as a pen and lunging at the witness testifying, then shots fired by a U.S. Marshal killing Angelou. Sayle was rushed to the hospital but passed away later that day. The court later defended the actions that were taken by the court martial. They said that he did what had to be done and that it didn't matter that all Sayle had to use as a weapon was a pen. 
If he had really wanted to kill the witness or anyone else, he would have done it if he wasn't stopped. I think there's no question though, you can turn a pen into a knife or its equivalent. You can take somebody's life with it. According to court documents, the witness was shackled and handcuffed. I think it happens so fast that it's easy if you slow down the video to maybe argue or suggest that there was enough time to do something different. The judge later admitted that it had been a major mistake to let Sayel, who everyone knew was a violent criminal, to sit in a courtroom around civilians with no restraints. If he had been restrained, then none of this would have happened, and he would likely still be alive. The especially sad part about this is that many of Sayel's family members were sitting in the courtroom that day and all saw him getting killed just a few feet away. What do you think about this situation? Was using a firearm to take Sayel down too dangerous of a reaction? Who all was really at fault here? Let us know what you think in the comments. In March of 2009, a 28-year-old man named David Paradiso was sitting in a courtroom in Stockton, California. He was there under some pretty disturbing circumstances. He was on trial for brutally killing his former girlfriend and dumping her body by the side of the road. On this particular day, several of David's family members, including his mother Deborah, were present in the courtroom, and they were worried. They said that David had been acting strangely and had been unpredictable and aggressive lately. Deborah was even concerned that he may have a weapon hidden on him. Even though she addressed these concerns with the court, it didn't sound like much, if anything at all, was done. If it had, what happened on this tragic day might have been prevented. It had been a rocky day in the courtroom, with Deborah even having to get up and leave at one point. But it wasn't until David was being cross-examined that everything took a shocking turn. All of a sudden, David completely flipped out. He set his sights on the judge presiding over the case, Cinda Fox, and lunged at her in a violent attack. David Paradiso's defense attorney is Chuck Pacheco. He joins us live in our HD newsroom. Chuck, I know that you've been on kind of both sides of this. You were a CHP officer for a while. You've been a defense attorney for a lot of years. You've been in a lot of courtrooms, and I've known you for 15 years. Have you ever seen anything like this? Chuck Pachero had seen more trials throughout his lifetime than he could count. But even after all that time, he had never seen anything even close to this happen. No, this is very, very unusual. What, what was going through your mind? Was your mouth like, what's happening here? Did you freeze? Did you make a move? Or was it just surreal? No, um, I, re I reacted. I didn't know I did, but I... Um, once the um, Paradiso jumped on the judge and um, began to stab her in the neck, I moved uh, from the council table up to the judge's uh, uh, table. David got Judge Fox to the ground, and with a weapon in hand, he started going at her neck. Paradiso was working on her uh, right side of her neck with, a, with some sort of a sharp instrument and, and with a standing motion. And I found myself right up there um, at the judge's bench to assist her. Mm -hmm. And then the, a police officer came from my left, reached over uh, my shoulder area, and, and put a gun against uh, Paradiso's chest. Seconds later, David had been taken down by an officer's firearm and laid dead on the ground. The whole thing happened so fast that Chuck could barely even process what had happened. But that doesn't mean that there weren't still red flags earlier in court that suggested that something like this might end up happening. Told on two occasions, sit down, sit down by a deputy. Mm -hmm. uh, I then yelled at him, sit down. And, um, and that's when he uh, pulled this uh, object out of his pocket, looked around, and then he was no more than four feet from the judge to her right rear, and then began to uh, attack her. Chuck also recalled that he was so transfixed on the sight of David violently driving his weapon into the judge's neck that when the officer's firearm went off, he didn't even realize where in the courtroom it was coming from. Uh, as I was approaching the judge's um, um, bench, uh, rushing up there to, to aid her, I heard two shots from behind me to my left. Didn't know where they were coming from. I was just um, watching the instrument and watching him work and, and with a stabbing motion to the right side of her um, neck. Everyone watched in horror as paramedics rushed in to help Judge Fox. She was placed on a stretcher and quickly led out to an ambulance. Luckily, her injuries were not life-threatening and she managed to give a small wave to worried people gathered outside the courtroom to confirm that she was okay. Meanwhile, David's family are heartbroken as they watched him get killed right in front of their eyes. But more importantly, 
they are really angry because they say that this whole thing was handled terribly. After all, they had warned the court that David might do something like this, and still extra steps had not been taken to help prevent this from happening. David's brother says that David was not a mentally stable person, but he was also not the person that he was portrayed to be by law enforcement. David was sick. He, he, he made calls on himself to the police. He didn't need the meth. You see, you see yesterday, did he have meth? The whole trial, they painted him as crazy. Where was the drugs? He didn't need drugs yesterday. David's family believes that if things had been handled differently, maybe he would still be here. Ryan Nichols was on trial for before this day would end, he'd kill twice more. I think you're seeing SWAT officers uh, uh, coming out now. For 26 hours, Atlanta was on lockdown. The nation riveted. Evading capture, Nichols weaved his way to Duluth, Georgia, a suburb 27 miles outside the city. This last story is as shocking and disturbing as it is tragic. In fact, it is such a dramatic story, full of twists and turns, that there was actually a movie made about it. It is the story of Brian Nichols, who in March of 2005 managed to get free while in an Atlanta, Georgia courtroom. He went on to wage an attack on the whole community, including the courthouse staff. He then escaped, leading cops on a massive manhunt while the whole country watched in shock. It was mass murder. The judge had been shot. A deadly shooting inside an Atlanta courthouse. A judge, his stenographer, murdered. Everybody is now working on this case. The suspected gunman, that man, caught on surveillance camera escaping down a stairwell. While on the run, Brian ended up meeting a young woman under the most random and unpredictable circumstances. It was this woman who was able to convince him to stop everything he was doing and take a hard look at the kind of life he was living. Let's start this tragic story from the beginning, with the beginning of Brian's life of crime. He was born in 1971, to what was already a broken family. He was exposed to serious crimes from a very young age, and he often found himself getting in trouble and being around cops. But Brian still had goals and hope for his life, and was willing to work hard to make them happen. So despite the fact that nobody expected him to, Brian was able to stay out of trouble long enough to finish high school and graduate. Then he even began attending college. But sadly, his life would later be derailed once again after he started getting involved with drugs. Brian's drug use took him down a dark and dangerous path. It changed who he was and caused him to make decisions he wouldn't have made while sober. Brian had been dating a girl who he really cared about, but their relationship had come to a recent end. Then he made a discovery that sent him into an absolute rage. He found out that she had a new boyfriend, but she hadn't moved on with just anyone. She was dating the pastor who worked at the church that they both attended. Brian decided that he was going to get revenge on her. He then kidnapped his ex and assaulted her. While she survived, Brian was ultimately arrested, charged with kidnapping and assault, and was looking and possibly getting many years behind bars. But after he faced trial, it ended with a hung jury. This meant that he would have to face trial yet again. But this time around, he had been busy planning something huge and horrible. It was March 11th of 2005 and Brian was brought to court for his trial like normal. He was being guarded by a female sheriff deputy named Cynthia Hall. Brian had been allowed to change his prison uniform into nice clothes for the trial, and Cynthia was going to watch him while he was doing this. But when Cynthia least expected it, Brian turned on her. He grabbed her weapon and fired it at her. She sustained serious injuries and later wound up in a coma. But Brian didn't care about what he had just done to an innocent woman. He was only thinking about what his next action was going to be. He knew that if he was going to make it out of the courthouse and to freedom undetected, he was going to have to blend in. So he put on civilian clothes and started walking out as confidently as he could. His change of clothes was not enough of a disguise and two case managers and a lawyer recognized him right away. Brian pointed the firearm he had just stolen at all three of them and forced them to take him to the judge. They didn't have any choice but to do what he told them to do. The judge who was going to be presiding over Brian's case was a man named Roland Brown. 
he had quickly become Brian's number one target. He wanted to kill him, and he wasn't going to let anyone get in his way. Meanwhile, a sergeant named Grantley White realized what was going on and attempted to get the weapon away from Brian. When that didn't work, he pressed an emergency button that alerted everyone in the courthouse that there was a very dangerous situation going on. But Brian still managed to get Judge Barnes and fire his weapon at him. He also fired at a court reporter named Julie Ann Brando and another sergeant named Hoyt Telsey. All three of these people were killed on the spot. After wreaking complete havoc throughout the courthouse, Brian dashed out the door to freedom and continued his reign of terror on the whole community. In just a short period of time as a free man, he managed to steal multiple vehicles, kidnap a young girl, and kill yet another person. This victim was a cop named David G. Wilhelm. After murdering David, Brian stole his badge and his car and took off again. Brian knew every officer in the city was out looking for him, and he needed to find a place to hide right away. He went to a nearby apartment complex and forced himself into the first one he found. That apartment belonged to a 26-year-old woman named Ashley Smith. The unforgettable story of a young widow held hostage at gunpoint. Her captor, an escaped killer on a rampage. But the captive somehow manages to turn desperation into salvation for them both. There wasn't any particular reason that Brian chose Ashley's apartment. It was just the first one that he came across. Smith and Nichols had no connection, had never met, until he put a gun in her back and pushed his way into her apartment. For seven long hours, Brian stayed at Ashley's apartment, holding her hostage while keeping his firearm on him at all times. He could have killed her at any second, and she knew that. But there was something about Ashley that had a major impact on Brian. He not only decided to spare her life, but actually ended up having a long and deep conversation with her. It wasn't until the next morning that Ashley called 911 to alert the authorities about what had happened. At that point, Brian was long gone. Um, Brian Nichols uh, came to my house at 2 o'clock last night. That 911 call ended the manhunt. That voice, 26-year-old Ashley Smith, held hostage by a killer for seven torturous hours. At the time that Brian showed up on Ashley's doorstep and forced his way inside, Ashley was not at a very happy place in her life. She had lost her husband under horribly tragic circumstances and turned to drugs to cope. Now she wasn't even allowed to see her young daughter. She's now 37. Back then, Smith lived alone, a recovering meth addict, a dead-end job. She'd lost custody of her five-year-old daughter and her dignity after the murder of her husband years early. But Ashley wanted to turn her life around so she could be the best mom possible for her daughter. She had gotten sober, she started reading the Bible, and was on a good path. But now, after all of that, it was looking like she was probably going to be killed by this murderer standing in her apartment, pointing a weapon at her face. But still, Ashley clung on to the hope that maybe, just maybe, she would make it out of this very bad situation with her life. God, that, uh, you know, please just, if you can get me out of here alive. It's not that I didn't care what happened, I was just trying to prepare for the worst. Even though Ashley had stopped using drugs, she still had some of them in her apartment, and Brian ended up finding them. The guns are in the bathroom, and you're trying to figure out what to do next. Walk me through that. I thought about grabbing the guns, but then I thought, you know what? <laughs> I've never used a gun in my life. And then when he said, if you do what I say, I won't hurt you, um, I had to believe it. Brian asked Ashley to sit down and do the drugs with him. Even though he was holding a weapon and could have killed her at any moment, she still told him no. She knew that if she was going to die, she wanted to be sober during her last few moments. So what was Brian Nichols' reaction when you told him no? just accepted it. I told him that those drugs had ruined my life and I wanted no part of it. He did two lines and he left one sitting there. Because I knew if I was gonna die, I didn't want to meet Jesus having drugs at my nose. I wanted to just be normal. Eventually, Ashley started talking to Brian about this book that she had been reading that she had said really changed her life. It was written by a pastor and it was about how to live your life with a purpose. The way that she described the book must have really interested Brian because he asked her to take it out and read from it. And so she agreed. He sat down and listened quietly as she read the book aloud. Smith would show Nichols not only defiance, but dignity. The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. It says God deserves your best. He expects the most of what you've been given. 
The book made Brian think about his own life. He started to wonder what his own purpose in life was. Ashley told him about all the terrible things she had been through with losing her husband and the drugs and not being able to see her daughter. When she was done, she asked Brian what he thought her purpose in life was, and he had a very interesting response. Did they let you finish reading? Well, when I finished reading, I said, what do you think my purpose is? He said, I think you need to share your story with people. The more they talked, the more that both of them seemed to totally forget about the circumstances that they were in, and the fact that Brian had just killed four people. Ashley no longer felt afraid, and she believed that God was going to protect her. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ took the body of Brian Nichols. I could just feel the power of God. It was almost like I knew he was there. And sure enough, what Brian did was a surprise to everyone. Perhaps the hardest thing of all to believe. Nichols, the man who in just the past day killed four people in cold blood, let Ashley Smith go free. I said I have to go. You don't need this. The killer and the hostage, both parents, he with a newborn son, she had an appointment that morning to see her little girl. Ashley told him that she was going to have to leave and that she had a meeting she could not miss. He was understanding and did not try to keep her from going. He handed me some money that he had in his pocket and then I just left. I remember walking out the door, my knees were still shaking as I got to the car and I, I thought, this is too good to be true. Surely he's going to come out and f*** me. But Ashley got into her car and drove away, and Brian didn't follow her. After that, she called the cops, and Brian was arrested later that day. He confessed to everything he had done from assaulting his ex to killing all those people during his escape. But he pleaded guilty to his charges, claiming mental insanity. Throughout his trials, which was one of the most expensive trials on record, it was determined that Brian probably did have a lot of mental health problems. But at the end of the day, the jury didn't believe that it was enough to excuse all of the terrible things that he did and all the lives he had hurt. So he was ultimately convicted in November of of 2008 and soon after sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. While behind bars, there were times that Brian was given the chance to do interviews about his life and all the things he had done, but he refused. Years later though, he did finally agree to a short interview. The Fulton County Courthouse killer is opening up to us, Channel 2 Action News, 11 years after that deadly rampage. Brian Nichols says he has stayed quiet because he didn't want to cause more damage than he already has. He claimed he didn't want to hurt any more people. Brian acknowledged that he had caused a lot of damage to a lot of different lives and says that he is sorry for what he's done. Very bad thing. His victims in March 2005, Judge Roland Barnes, court reporter Julie Brando, Deputy Hoyt Teasley, federal agent David Wilhelm. Doing an interview with you, there will be nothing that I want from that, really, other than to express my remorse for the things that I've done. Brian remains locked up, and that is likely where he will stay until the end of his life. But Ashley's story about meeting him and everything that happened afterward is still having an impact on people even now. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.